Today we'll be talking about prostate enlargement or BPH. Um, it's a very, very common problem and being involved in men's health, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, what is BPH? Well, BPH is the non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate. Uh, B stands for benign or non-cancerous enlargement. P stands for prostatic or related to the prostate. And hyperplasia uh, is a medical term referring to the multiplication of the cells. It's a very common finding. Uh, associated with age, meaning that as you get older, it's not a matter of if you get it, it's a matter of when you get it. The incidence is proportional to age, so a 50-year-old man has about a 50% chance of having this condition. Today I have Dr. Marsh joining me from Concord Hospital. He's a urologist. He joins me as the discussant today. A uh, few words about Dr. Marsh. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Northwestern University. Medical doctorate from the New, Ham, uh, New, uh, sorry, New, uh, New York Medical College, urology training at uh, SUNY Downstate, and fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. He's board certified by the American Board of Urology and also uh, the Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery Board. He has extensive experience both uh, in female and male voiding dysfunction, and he has additional skills uh, pertinent to today's discussion uh, with uh, Botox injections in the bladder as well as uh, sacral neuromodulation or ways to uh, help with bladder function by affecting the nerves that go to the bladder. Uh, in addition, he's my uh, roommate in the office so he can't get out of this. So uh, if you share an office with me and uh, it's my show, you're going to be on it. So he's a good sport. So welcome Dr. Marks. Um, before we get into this, uh, I, I'm going to loosen you up a little bit. So thanks sure. for coming on. So thanks the first thing I want to do is, yeah, no sweat is uh, have a discussion just, you know, you know, we're here on Concord TV and we're dis uh, discussing, you know, medical issues, but I always try to, you know, bring it back to the hospital, us, our practice. So what brought you to urology and to Concord? Mm -hmm. And then we'll, you know, dive into the subject matter. Absolutely. This is, uh, could be a long discussion, but it's a 30 uh, minute we'll try show, to make it, we'll to make show, it short. <laughs> In medical training, I, I, I thought I was going to be a cardiologist, and I happened to be on a surgical rotation and had the privilege of being exposed to what urology was. A uh, senior resident who was on that uh, service um, was friends with the intern. Um, I got to hang out with them for one day and realized, hey, these guys are kind of a lot more relaxed and a, and a lot funnier than the general surgical team I was working with. And so just happened to um, watch some of their procedures and that was around the time that the Da Vinci uh, surgical uh, prostatectomy for radical prostatectomies for prostate cancer was kind of up and coming. And, and I really just loved the technology that, that we had access to as urologists, as urologic surgeons. Um, I went into this field thinking I was going to be a urologic cancer surgeon, but of course interests change over time. And uh, that's really what brought me into urology. Got it. How about, how about Concord Hospital proper and us? Yeah, I think that was a delusion of grandeur. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to be here. I was looking for a place in the Northeast, in New England in particular. My wife and I were engaged in finding a, a nice community where we could raise a family uh, that was outside of the hustle and bustle of the major cities. I had lived in New York for nine years, and as much as I loved New York City, I, I kind of had to get away. And um, I had heard about a wonderful opportunity here with a great group of individuals, um, a fantastic team environment. Um, and so being interested in New England, hearing about this job, I, I came on, interviewed, and it was phenomenal. And yeah, since sweet, then, man. it's been great. Great. Awesome. So you're happy to be here, e even though you share an office with me? You know, there are days. <laughs> okay. Can you just give me a, a flavor? I mean, we know the symptoms are hard, but for the, for the public, you know, what are those symptoms that could bring you into the office? that could be attributable to prostate enlargement or overactive bladder and you know how do we kind of sort through all that? Sure, there are, there are a lot of men who, who get referred to our practice for a primary complaint of urinary incontinence. What is incontinence? It is basically leakage of urine that you don't want to happen. You can't get to the bathroom in time and you suddenly have an accident. You find yourself needing to change your clothes, um, needing to run or rush to the bathroom and this gets billed as incontinence. Um, some people will start billing it as overactive bladder immediately and, and because of what I do as a subspecialist those often get referred. That being said, some of these individuals who are men have a, an enlarged prostate and you ask yourself 
what is the underlying cause or root of this problem? Quite frankly, it's hard to say, is it a chicken or an egg? Is it the bladder problem that started first, or is it the prostate problem that led to the bladder problem? And if you look at um, what we know clinically, if you look at what we can see in the medical literature, we do know that any form of blockage from the bladder, such as a prostate blockage in a man, will lead to changes in the bladder that can stimulate this urge or this frequent need to go. And oftentimes when folks are referred to us for incontinence, if I see them first, I'm initially trying to rule out a prostate problem as the first reason why they're here if they're here to see me for incontinence. And that's a good differentiation. Uh, unlike the female patients who have incontinence, they don't have a prostate. So a lot of times, the you know, it's funny, we're at a medical show and we're saying something pretty obvious, but I think that automatically excludes the, there are women that have obstructive components, but by and large, a man that's coming to see somebody for urinary problems, you always have to have them at the top of the list, particularly if they're in that BPH age range that I Correct. discussed. Correct. It, it's much less likely that a woman's bladder will be blocked unless they've had a previous surgery. But, but the same reasoning goes. You know, if, if someone's having that urge to go and that incontinence because they can't make it there in time, you have to think about, is it caused by something else? Is it an independent problem or is it caused by another problem? And we're always looking for that other problem. As, as surgeons, as doctors, we are kind of the scientists trying to figure out, you know, what's the cause of what's happening here? Yeah, and how do we fix people, right? That's so, always the, the trick. Yeah, so, uh, so as we talk about men or women, one thing that comes to the top of the list as we're treating people is, uh, you know, what are the behavioral aspects of it? And something um, that works for both men and women, but I always talk to the men about, particularly if they're older, are, um, you know, what are the behavioral things, dietary things we can tell people that really aren't going to hurt? I think a lot of times when they come, a patient sees us and they say, oh, I'm going to go see a doctor. Oh, he's going to want to do surgery. Oh, he's going to want to give me a bunch of pills. Oh, I hate side effects. I'd rather try this herb that hasn't even been studied <laughs> that could thin my blood or give me liver failure. But I'd rather take that than tamsulosin or something like that. But give me a flavor for the community about, uh, you know, in the public, what, what could we tell people that ain't going to hurt them that's going to help, possibly? Sure. I think the biggest piece of misinformation that's out there is drinking copious amounts of water. This came from dietary programs. If you fill yourself up with water, you don't need to eat. So this, you got to drink eight cups of water a day. While it's great to be hydrated, it's good to protect your kidneys. It's going to prevent kidney stones. Um, it, it's good to keep you out of the hospital for other reasons. It may be too much because you're getting other sources of fluid intake during the day. So if you're drinking eight cups of water, which ends up being eight bottles of water, because we don't think of a cup as eight ounces, we get patients that come in drinking eight bottles of water in addition to their juices, their coffees, their teas, their sodas. And those are the, the, the very, very big irritants of the bladder caffeinated products, coffee in particular, even decaf coffee, um, teas, mostly black teas, green teas, also because of the caffeine and the other substances, any acidic beverages, particularly acidic juices, uh, sodas, too many sodas, or caffeinated sodas. These are all things that can contribute to many of these symptoms. That being said, most of us can normally drink several glasses of water and a few cups of coffee and not be wetting our pants. But sometimes, when something else is going on, it's making the bladder extra sensitive to these bladder irritants. Mm -hmm. So you could say, you know, when I was 35, I was drinking five cups of coffee a day and I didn't have a problem. Now I can't even drink one now that I'm 55. That's a sign that something else is going on. It's not just the bladder irritant. It's definitely making it worse. But there's some other underlying cause. And when we go back to men who come in who are 55, the first thing we start to think about is enlargement of the prostate. Yeah, yeah, thanks for, you, you hit all the highlights. And some other things that I tell patients that are easy stuff is to do time voiding. So every other hour while you're awake and double voiding. So have a man go, wait, and then go again. I see in my a men's health practice, the whole concept of terminal dribbling, meaning that after you go, there's a little bit of, I call it the old smoke trail that kind of like leaks out. and. You, you try to put it away and it's like, oh, it's so frustrating. And I tell the guy, take your time, you know, pee, wait, pee again, completely empty. And behaviorally, you could try to coax a little bit out. And a lot of it depends on the guy and what, what bothers them. 
Absolutely. That's a great non-medical management, non-surgical management of the condition. How can you modify your lifestyle or your behaviors so that you can make symptoms better without resorting to medicine or surgery? That being said, I tell my patients, you know, listen, if it doesn't bother you to go to the bathroom every one hour, fine. But if you can't play tennis, do whatever you do for fun, your leisurely activities, if you can't go to work easily and do your job because you have to urgently find a bathroom, that's when it gets from, yeah, this is present and kind of a nuisance to it's a bother and it's really affecting your quality of life and your ability to get through your day and your daily activities. That's when intervention seems more necessary. Sure. I think it also depends on what sports you do because anybody that plays a lot of golf has a very high tolerance for their symptoms because anybody that golfs tells me, oh, doc, it's no problem. Every hole I just go into the woods and take care of my business and go back out to the hole. But you're right, no, it's not, that's not normal. There's a urologist <laughs> who's actually come up with a quite clever in invention. Oh, I've heard about this. Yes, this it's, club. A, it's the Euro Club. We, we have to be careful because it is a pu <laughs> public access, so we can't be plugging anything. But I hear what you're saying. There are devices that you can use on the, <laughs> on the golf course to try to <laughs> relieve yourself without embarrassing yourself out into the woods. Um, so you know, one other thought mm. too, just to kind of top that part off as far as the behavioral modification. I think sleep apnea too. Um, people that have sleep apnea, um, nighttime urination, very common thing. Any thoughts on your mind about, uh, about the whole concept of sleep disturbances and sleep apnea and urinary function in men? Absolutely. I see a lot of patients referred strictly for nocturia. And when it is solely frequent urination at night and no other daytime symptoms related to the bladder, it's the first thing on my mind. Um, this is caused by the overproduction of urine at night when you're sleeping. There's a couple different causes for this. One would just be you're consuming too much water at night, but, but other causes are things that maybe are medical conditions that require some sort of uh, assessment and even uh, involvement. And when people are snoring, if they're blocking their airway and they're not getting enough oxygen because their airway is blocked from, from the neck down, then the oxygen level in the blood decreases and it sends a signal to the heart, a part of the heart, the top part of the heart, the atrium. It sends a hormone out into the bloodstream. This hormone is picked up by the kidneys and it's basically the best diuretic known to man because it makes the body think like we're drowning, we're choking in too much fluid. So it tries to pour as much fluid out of the body as possible. This was a, a safety mechanism that our bodies were designed to have to prevent heart failure from killing us in the middle of the night when we're sleeping. But people with sleep apnea have this same thing happen. They will pour out tons of urine. So when someone tells me they really only urinate often at night and the daytime isn't a bother, I have them record a bladder diary, recording how much urine they make over a whole day, 24 hours, and then trying to differentiate how much of it is made at night versus how much is over the entire day. And if there's more than a third of urine that's produced at night, then we have to start thinking about that. There are some other telltale signs, you know, someone who snores so loudly that their wife kicks them out of bed. Um, neck size, you take a look at their neck, you know, 17 inch circumference or higher. So if you're wearing a 17 inch collar and you're telling me you snore and you pee 10 times a night, I, I have my diagnosis without doing anything else. That's it's, true. It's probably not all related to the prostate. And I think having the uh, significant other helps too, yeah, this, this, the mm -hmm. whole sleep disturbance thing I think is, is underrated. And I have a lot of people that we talk about nighttime urination and we talk about snoring. They get in to see a sleep specialist, put on the CPAP, it stops. And I think that's a good differentiation for the audience is that you know, when you get up at night, do you get up at night to pee or are you peeing because you're up? Because I have nervous patients that I ask them, well, you, what are you doing when you get up? You get up to urinate and then go back to sleep? Oh, no, doc. I'm really worried. I check the doors. I, you know, look at the dog. I do this and then I can't get back to sleep. And I'm like, well, you, you have a sleep problem or that's not as worrisome if they're really anxious and got to check all the doors four times a night because they maybe have an anxiety problem versus the present. Oh, no, doc, I get up. I try to go. It's really hard to start. It takes me 20 minutes to get it going. That, that's, that's uh, you know, more of an issue. Um, so, good. Sorry, any, any That's exactly that? where I start to, you know, is this an emptying problem, meaning is it the prostate? Is this a bladder problem, meaning the bladder is extra sensitive to how much urine it can store and it's, it's not happy storing much and it's spasming storing too much and you get a bladder spasm, you got to go. Is it a urine production problem, which is where we get back into, is it sleep apnea? Is it something related to swelling? A lot of people get swelling in their legs. Mm -hmm. That fluid that is pulled down into the legs by gravity is a huge volume. When you lie flat going to bed at night, there's no more gravity on that. It goes back into the bloodstream, you pee it out. So do they just need 
a diuretic or compression stockings. Um, and then you're right, right on target. Is this a sleep disorder? Is this a sleep problem? People wake up because their dogs wake them up because their significant others wake them up or they have anxiety or they really just have a sleep problem. And that's where our colleagues in sleep medicine actually are, oh, yeah. are really great. Some of the more elderly people that have dependent edema or swelling of the legs, another behavioral dietary modification is if you're up all day, just put your feet up on an ottoman or recliner and you're going to pull that fluid back in and hopefully you, you urinate that out before it's, you know, three in the morning. So that was a good discussion on that. Um, so let's jump to medications and uh, switch gears to, you know, so you have the person that's in your office and we'll, we'll, let's get it back to the prostate. We start talking about medicines. We can branch that off into several classifications of medicine. I think the first go-to medication is one that affects the smooth muscle cells or the muscle cells within the prostate. Our prostate is made up of essentially two components sort of a fibrous tissue with muscle cells, as well as glands, which are the prostate glands. And it's those glands in the prostate that get cancer, but they can also multiply and enlarge, which is where we get prostate enlargement. So we can target multiple things. We can target the muscle cells in the prostate, and those are medications that help expand or dilate open uh, the prostate channel, because this is really, it's plumbing, right? We have plumbing that's clogged or narrowed. How do we open that plumbing right up again. And those medicines that help make that muscle sort of expand open are a great first start because they work instantly. So we're talking about someone who comes in with frequent urgent urination and doesn't make it. They have this incontinence, but they have an enlarged prostate. I think the first line of therapy really to get them better quicker is to start that category of medications. We can list off some of their uh, generic names. There are many of them, uh, Tamsulosin, Alfiazosin, doxazosin, terazosin. So we have a number of them and they work great because they'll often work within the first week or two. You'll notice the first thing everybody notices is increased force of urinary stream. The rest of the stuff takes a little while longer because if the bladder has been suffering for so long because of the prostate, it's not going to heal right away. It's like if you bend over, pick up something heavy and you pull your back out. You got to take a bunch of ibuprofen. You got to put heat packs on it. You got to rest. The bladder needs time, same thing. So we always start, or most always start, with those categories of medication. Sure, the alpha blockers. The alpha blockers, those tamsulosin, alfiazosin. So they often give pretty quick results. The next checkup, or the next plan, is if the prostate's very, very big on exam, and we know they're not responding solely to the, the alpha blocker medications, <clears throat> I like to try to reduce the size of the prostate. That can be done with what is called a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor medication. The generic names of these medications is finasteride and dutasteride. Remember we talked again about uh, the two different parts of the prostate, the muscle cells that can expand and the glands that we want to shrink down or reduce in size, and the finasteride and dutasteride, which are 5-alpha reductase inhibitor medications, will cause the prostate to shrink down. That's definitely a good second line. When we get beyond that, we start talking about what I call my triple therapy. My triple therapy is adding a bladder medication. If someone's not getting better quick enough, we try to add a bladder medication to make the bladder symptoms get better. The 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, finasteride and dutasteride, we often don't see immediate results. It takes months for the prostate to really shrink down in size and for the effects of that medicine to, to be really evident. So many times they'll come back saying, hey doc, I'm, I'm still peeing all over the place. I really need help. That's when we can put them on these bladder medications, which have been termed overactive bladder medications. And yes, they can be used in prostate uh, conditions too, because we're treating a symptom. Those medicines treat a symptom. That symptom is the urge to go, the incontinence because of that urge to go, uh, and the bladder muscle spasms. Those medications are, uh, there are about uh, seven of them actually, and uh, there's a few generics, and now there are a few brand names. Yeah, so the simple uh... generics are like oxybutynin, a tolteridine, um, and they're great uh, adjuncts to treating these prostate-associated symptoms. Yeah, I think the one caveat is to just make sure that the bladder is empty, there you go. which is what you were yeah. about to say. I was getting the, I was like, oh, I was starting to get a little nervous about that because when you mentioned the, uh, the anticholinergic medications or bladder relaxers, I mean, it's, it's in our um, AUA guidelines or the American Urological Association guidelines, you could use them, but uh, we always got to be careful about that realm because um, I tell patients that you can have a cough, 
and you can take a cough medication to take care of your cough, and that's great if you've got a tickle in your throat, but if you have lung cancer, you're not gonna take your Robitussin to take care of your problems. So I kind of think of those anticholinergics or bladder relaxers the same way. If you really do have OAB or overactive bladder, certainly it could be very helpful, but if you've got that prostate problem, you're possibly gonna make things worse. And we can dive into that stuff kind of, you know, we wanna keep it topical to the prostate, and it certainly straddles both ends. Uh, but I gotta tell you, a lot of people could get in trouble with those anticholinergics if not used appropriately. That's why you have to have kind of our, th this, this experience in our practice where we have someone that's kind of prostate facing, bladder facing, to kind of hammer out these things because out in the community, I think a lot of primary care providers do overwrite them. I also noticed that in, uh, in the medical realm with Proscar or Finasteride, there are people that apply it, but at the same time, they have a different timeline about how to do it, meaning that even the primary care physicians in the community would put somebody on the finasteride, which are these shrinking medications. It does shrink your prostate up to 30%, but guess what? It takes about six months to a year, and I think uh, even in the medical community, there's a lack of awareness of that. And when you have a patient that comes to your office and they say, oh my gosh, doc, I tried Flomax, it didn't work. Oh, I tried the finasteride. Yeah, I tried it for about a week and it stopped. It didn't work, so I just stopped taking it. And you didn't give it enough, enough time. So, um, and, uh, and, and another word, how about this? Um, there's another class of medications that has gotten recent uh, publicity. I'm talking about Tadalafil, um, which, which is an interesting medication, meaning that uh, you, you gave a great, great, great review of the pathophysiology. We may have to put that up on a, a medical school uh, video about how, how these things work. But we have a biological basis for why an alpha blocker works. We talked about the prostate muscle relaxation of the capsule. We talked about finasteride, dutasteride. These are the five alpha reductase shrinking medications. Uh, try to keep it simple for the community that you know there's, there's the alpha blockers and the five alpha reductase. We know how they work. Well, then there's the ED medications, Tadalafil, that we're not exactly sure how that works, but any comments on, on your end about the use of uh, such a medication? I like it in a certain population of patients. Honestly, when people have failed some of the other medications, they have a smaller prostate, but they have a lot of urge frequency. I found that I try to use it. Why does it work? I don't know. I call it the feel-good mm. medication. Yeah. I just feel good on it. Maybe that's because it partially helps some of the erectile dysfunction as well. That being said, we have some thought process on the mechanism, the pathophysiology of why this works. Uh, the reason why it works for a lot of other problems is that uh, these medications allow blood vessels to dilate. As blood vessels dilate, we get more blood flow. We don't 100% understand some of the urgency frequency symptoms. We can call it BPH, we can call it OAB. There's probably a lot of crossover. When we get a lot of crossover, we wonder what is the underlying reason. And, and there was definitely a paper that, that I did with Jerry Blavis out in New York <clears throat> back in the day. Shout out, um, huh? That we, uh, nice. <laughs> we looked at what is the overall differential diagnosis of overactive bladder. A lot of people get billed as overactive bladder by, by the, the primary care situation. Just like you said, overused medications, overdiagnosed condition. Absolutely. What's the underlying cause of the symptoms? What about ischemia? Loss of blood flow. As we get older, as we age, even in that BPH realm, that, that enlarged prostate realm of, of age, the 40s, 50s, 60s, we're getting atherosclerotic blood vessel disease. We're getting calcifications of those blood vessels. It's causing a reduced blood flow. That's why we get erectile dysfunction. And that's really just a, a marker of you're about to have coronary artery disease. Because once those small blood vessels start shrinking down because of plaques, we worry about the bigger blood vessels. Those are the same blood vessels that also go to the bladder. You know? So if we're reducing blood flow to the bladder, why isn't it going to be upset? When you reduce blood flow to the heart, you get chest pain. You get angina. That's a heart attack. When you reduce blood flow to the bladder, who's to say it's not going to be angry and it's not going to start causing some symptoms, such as urgency and frequency? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it works in multiple ways. The nitric oxide going into the blood vessels causing expansion, but it works on those smooth muscle cells. So it could also be relaxing the smooth muscle cells in the prostate, which is what's causing some of the, the symptom relief as well. I think that's where a lot of that relief comes from. And we don't know exactly why, but it's certainly fodder for good research is that, you know, what is the role of the smooth muscle? And we know that for the ED medications, it does improve blood flow, helps with smooth muscle relaxation to help with erectile function. Uh, the prostate's a capsule, it's got, you know, muscular tone there, bladder neck has muscular tone. 
Uh, so um, yeah, so it's another element. So like we discussed, uh, we discussed today on today's show, just to kind of recap, uh, we taught, discussed the dietary behavioral modification. Well, first we introed you, right? You know, that, that's huge, right? So number one, we did Dr. Mark's intro to the community. Thank you. And uh, we did the uh, behavioral modification. We talked about uh, the various uh, medications that people use for uh, prostate enlargement and also that duality between the prostate side of it and also the bladder side. And I think you really articulately said, you know, men can have a prostate problem or a bladder problem, but usually a little bit of both. And uh, this is a two-parter, like I mentioned. So I think this is a good time to wrap this up on this part. And then I think as surgeons, you know, we, the thing I love about being a urologist, and that's why you went into it, is that we have great toys. <laughs> I think everyone likes the fact that the urologists have Da Vinci robot lithotriptors, fancy lasers, uh, green light lasers, sacral neuromodulators, you know, but I think what I like about being a urologist the most is that we take care of the disease process. And if you have a problem, if you need medication, we do it. If you need surgery, we do it. And we cover both ends. So this is part one, uh, medical side of it. And next episode, we'll, we'll hit the surgical stuff and we'll dive in what happens when these medications don't quite work out and what the, uh, the follow-up is, uh, how we troubleshoot things, okay, Dr. Mark?